Some of us don't want to love anybody else until we know for sure that they love us. So Jesus, I just want to advise you that Jesus loved you first. Amen. Our scripture for tonight, we'll be looking at Mark chapter 5. Mark chapter 5, many of you have, have heard me preach this. But I want to look at Mark chapter 5, verses 1 through 20 from a Bible study angle. Mark chapter 5, verses 1 through 20. And we're going to approach it a little differently tonight and for the, a few Bible study time. We will approach it a little differently. Amen. Mark chapter 5, verses 1 through 20. We are going to talk about biblical hermeneutics and biblical homiletics. We're going to talk about biblical hermeneutics and homiletics. You have that word biblical down, right? Let me spare hermeneutics for those who, who struggle with this as I do. Hermeneutics is H-E-R-M-E-N-E-U-T-I-C-S. Let me try it a couple more times. Hermeneutics. H-E-R. Or H-E-R. H-E-R. Let me get you, give you a chance to take your pen out, your pencil, your paper. Biblical hermeneutics and homiletics. The word biblical and then hermeneutics is spelled H-E-R-M-E-N-E-U-T. ICS, hermeneutics. Yeah. Again, hermeneutics. H-E-R-M-E-N-E-U-T-I-C-S, hermeneutics. The next one is homoletics. H-O-M-I-L-E-T-I-C-S. H-O-M-I-L. E-T-C-S. You have Homolex. H-O-M-L-E-T-I-C-S. Everybody there? Yes? <clears throat> hermeneutics, the first word you wrote down, hermeneutics is the preparation in the study of the word. The preparation in the study of the word. It includes background, it includes culture, it includes verbs, nouns, words in the, the passage. Hermeneutics is the study of the word of God and the preparation of the presentation. The study of the word. Hermeneutics is the study of the word. Then you have homiletics, is what most of us are used to. Homiletics is the presentation of the word. So our Sunday school teachers stand on Sunday and they have gone through hermeneutics. They have prepared, they are ready. They have spent hours standing before the Lord, studying, studying the word, standing in the word, researching the word. They've spent hours in hermeneutics just to stand and present, meaning just to stand to do homiletics for 30 minutes to an hour. If you ask many preachers or teachers, uh, how much time do you spend in the word in order to, in order to prepare for a 30 to minutes to a 60 minute presentation, they will tell you 20 to 24 hours. Of course, they're not spending 24 hours sitting in one place in one setting, but they are spending 20 to 22 hours or 24 hours preparing for a 30 minute to an hour presentation. Just gathering facts, just gathering information. Now, I'm not one that uh, stand behind and rely on commentaries. I believe you ought to get your lesson. Amen. Then after you get your lesson, if you want to make some comparisons through commentary, do that, okay? So we're going to look at uh, hermeneutically at Mark chapter 5, verses 1 through 20. And we're going to talk homiletically through Mark chapter 5, verses 1 through 20. 
and you can spend 24 hours preparing for this. There are three phases of hermeneutics. There are three phases of hermeneutics. They are observation, interpretation, and application. Observation, observation. What do you see? What are you looking at? Observation, observation. I am looking at this word of God and I want to look at and see what I'm seeing. I want to, I want, we're not even wanting to understand it yet. I'm just going to read the scripture and see what I see. The second one is interpretation. Interpretation. Now I'm going to zero in on what I just read. I'm going to, I'm going to zero in and start talking about meanings, verbs, and Start talking about how it all comes together. So that is interpretation. How does this fit? Why did the author put this right here? That's interpretation. The final one is application. How does this apply? Key word is apply. How does this governs my life? How does this apply to my life? How does this apply to me? How does this regulate my heart. It's called application. Any of you spend any time in seminary or Bible study or anything, you already know that you gotta look at what's in the book. You wanna you wanna investigate by interpretation what's in the book. And then you want to see how it applies to your life. Scripture must be three things. Scripture must be relevant. Scripture must be relevant. The other thing is scripture must be clear. Scripture must be relevant. Scripture must be clear. And scripture must be accurate. And unless you do these three things, scripture won't be clear. Scripture won't be relevant. And scripture will not be accurate. I told you I was I was attending a church service and, and a member of that church and I said to the preacher afterwards, I said, man, you know, you did a good job. You know, preachers ought to be able to critique preachers, right? Talk to members do all the time. <laughs> I said, man, you, you did a good job in your homiletics, but you may want to look again at your hermeneutics. Now your homiletics is your presentation. So how did I know that he missed it in his homiletics, his hermeneutics? Because of what he said in his homiletics. See? So he, he says, he's preaching Isaiah chapter 6, and he talks about in his hoop, he says, oh, I'm looking for six wings when I die. I'm going to have six wings to cover my face. Two wings to cover my face. Two wings to cover my feet. Two wings, I'm going to fly. I said, well, you know, that's for seraphims. That's more like angels. We're not, we're not going to need any wings. When Jesus cracked the sky, we're going to get out of here. Period. And his conversation to me was, well, the folk liked it. <laughs> he said, didn't you hear him hollering back at me? Didn't you hear him shouting back at me? So now you're preaching so you can get a shot. Are you preaching so they can holler back at you? We cannot intercept or reject hermeneutics. Because if you don't get it right, you lie on God. And who wants to lie on God? So let's look at this. Let's do some observation. And I need you to participate with me. When we look at Mark chapter 5, we find a man there, and this man is living crazy. His position is in a crazy position. His attitude is in a, a crazy attitude. This man in Mark chapter 5 has a real problem. Here it is up here, Sister James. Right here on this panel. Mark chapter 5. Look at Mark chapter 5. Verse 1, Mark chapter 5. Then they came to the other side of the sea to the country of the Gadareans, verse two, and when he had come out of the boat, 
Immediately there met him out of the tombs a man with an unclean spirit who had his dwelling among the tombs and no one could bind him, not even with chains. Verse number four. Because he had been often, he often, he had often been bound with shackles and chains, and his chains had been pulled apart by him, and the shackles broken in pieces. Neither could anyone tame him. Verse 5. And always, day, always, night and day, he was in the mountains and in the tombs, crying out and cutting himself with stones. When, verse 6, when he saw Jesus afar off, he ran and worshipped him. Verse 7. And he cried out with a loud voice and said, What have I to do with you, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? I implore you by God that you do not torment me. Let's look at the first three verses. Verse 1. Then he, who is he, or they, then they, and then sometimes I get thrown off because I'm used to this in King James. I learned it in King James. I know it in King James. I can almost recite it in King James. So, so bear with me. Then they came to the other side of the sea. What's the first thing we see? They, meaning Jesus and his disciples came, right? We're just doing observation. Came to the other side of the sea. And they landed somewhere. Where did they land? Where did they land? Where did they stop? Where did they find themselves? The country of the Galileans. The country of the Galileans. Some, some call it Galileans. Some call it Galileans. The country of the Galileans. Okay? We see that. We know that's there. We can read that. Okay? And when he had come, now it says he. It said they first, right? So we see the change. Who is the he he's talking about? Jesus, right? How we know it's Jesus? It's a capital H, right? It's a capital H, so we know unless the author made a big mistake, unless the printers made a big mistake, and I've received some Bibles in the mail and I looked at it and the printer has made a massive mistake. So I got it on the shelf. Never to pick it up again. <clears throat> so when he came out of the boat, so Jesus, he, Jesus leaves the boat. They come to this place of the Galileans. They get off at this place. We're just talking about observation, right? When they get off in this place, then what does Jesus do? He get out of the boat. And when he had come out of the boat, then some time had passed or it came when? Immediately. Immediately. As soon as Jesus steps out of the boat, something happens. What happens? Man. Somebody else. What happens? What happens when he come, immediately he comes out of the boat? Then what happens? Man. There met him out of the tombs a man with an unclean spirit. Mm -hmm. What kind of spirit he had? Unclean. unclean. Was it a clean spirit? No. It was what kind of spirit? Unclean. unclean spirit. And he came from where? The tomb. Came out of the graveyard, out of the tomb. When I preached this, I called it good news from the graveyard. Good news, there ought to be some good news even from the graveyard. Call it good news from the graveyard. So he came out of the boat, immediately there met him out of the tombs, a man, a girl, a woman, a human being, a man. So here the word man means the male species, okay? There met him out of the tomb, a man. Now, if you look at another gospel writer, he, he identifies more than one man in the tomb. More than one man got an unclean spirit. But we're going to stick with the observation of Mark chapter 5. Out of the tomb, a man with an unclean spirit, 
And this man has shown himself to have supernatural power. How we know that? The next part of verse number three says, no one could bind him. I want to tell you that devil has supernatural powers. You don't believe that? This man had an unclean spirit. He had a devilish spirit. He had a messed up spirit. He had an ungodly spirit. No one could bind him. Nobody could bind him. Not even with chain. If you try to bind him with a rope, that won't work. How we know that? Because he could bind it with chain. Chain is this metal thing that's looped and daisy looped over and over again. So no one could bind him. Not even with chains. No one could shackle him. Verse 4. Because he had often been bound with shackles. How do I know no one could shackle him? Because he had often been bound with shackles. And what happened? When he was bound with shackles, he broke them in pieces. How do I know that? I see it in the scripture. I didn't have to go to the internet. I didn't have to go to Jet. Some people. Jet is coming back on the scene, you all. I didn't have to go to Ebony. It's back on the scene. It's right there in the Word. We don't have to go looking for it. And that's one of the things when you see someone who takes takes a text, text meaning the scripture, and then they give a they give a what do you call it? They they give a topic or a subject. When they give a topic or a subject, guess what happens? It ought to be taken from the, from the scripture. So on Sunday, you already know where I'm coming from, right? And you look at ahead of time. You observe it as you read in the scripture because it's already before you. You read in the scripture and as you read the scripture, you're already saying, hmm, I wonder which part of this verse they're going to use. Mm -hmm. Or you just say, oh, let me turn to this so I can sit down. <laughs> well, I know where he's coming from. It's on, the back, it's on the board. So I know he's coming from here. But you have to think through this stuff and read through it. Okay, so we're talking about observation. So what do we know about this man so far? By the time we get to verse number four, what do we know? Number one, what do we know? About the, just the man. What do we know about the man? He had an unclean spirit. He couldn't be bound. Not even with chains. Couldn't be bound with chains. He couldn't be shackled. He would always pull him apart. Always put him apart. He was in the tomb. Check this out. That's what I want you to say. He's he he he's in in the tomb. Now, King James said he has his dwelling in the tomb, mm -hmm. meaning he lived in the tomb. Now, what does a man have any business living in the graveyard? Mm -hmm. He's out of his mind. If it had been a snake in the graveyard, it would have been just fine. Had it been a rat in the graveyard, that's okay. If it hadn't been a bear in the graveyard, that's fine. But the problem is, this is a man, a human being, someone that God has created a little more than an angel in the graveyard. And King James said he wasn't just passing through the graveyard, he had his dwelling there. What does dwelling mean? He lived there. And because, because he lived there, you knew he was out of his mind. Some of us think that even people that's living under the bridge are out of their minds. But don't you know that some of those brothers are more educated than most of us? Don't you know some of those brothers and sisters have made more money than we would ever make? But if the Lord doesn't keep your mind, it can't be kept. So this man is living in the graveyard. He has supernatural power. I'm just trying to observe some things here. He has supernatural power. He's dwelling. Look at verse number three. Dwelling among the tombs. Living among the tombs. When Jesus shows up, it says something about when he got off the boat. He says, sooner than quick. Before right now. 
immediately there met him out of the tombs a man with what kind of spirit? An unclean spirit. You see, all the time we've spent on four verses already. And we're just in observation. We are not doing interpretation yet. We're not doing application yet. We are just observing what's in the text. Verse 3, he's dwelling among the tombs. No man could shackle him or chain him because when he was chained, they would hold him. Verse number 4, because he had often been, often been bound with shackles and with chains. So we know this man got a history, right? What is his history? When they tried to bind him, what happened? He broke them. We know that no man could bind him. No man could chain him. Not even with shackles. Nobody could deal with him. Now let me ask you a question. If you were there, would you be responsible for shackling this man? Would you want to work for the SPA, SPCA at that time? Would you want to work with human resources? And I'm not talking about I'm not talking about human resources as you know it. Somebody is hiring. I'm talking about resources that's going to help this man. Do you think any social services would help him? They couldn't even get him back to the office. You think the police could deal with him? He break those little flimsy handcuffs. Couldn't shackle him. In the Mississippi Delta where I grew up, even today, police officers are right and skinny. They get a call, they won't make the ten of them get there before, before they approach somebody. And it's because the devil is not only raising his head, the devil is on the warpath. The devil is out to kill, steal, and destroy. And the Bible has already prophesied. The devil wants your very, very life. We just talking about occupation. Look at, look at, he's in the tomb. Now tell me, should this man be in the tomb? Why not? There's some people out there. What's wrong with him being in the tomb? He came to fellowship. No fellowship going on out there. And, and you know what that tells us? We should not be afraid to walk through the graveyard at midnight. Because y'all already know everybody out there is dead. You should not have a problem with walking by the funeral home at night. You should not have a problem when you go to a wake going in the back room looking around. You should have a problem when live folk with two feet standing up approach you. If they are already dead, I mean, I dare say 99.99.99% of the people in this world rather not live next door to a graveyard. Why is that? Why? I mean, is it just a myth? Is it just some some fairy tale that we've been told? Is it just something we we hadn't gotten used to? Who wanna tell me? Why you want why you don't want to live in the graveyard? Live in the graveyard? Back home people have houses right next to the graveyard. Back home they worship. You walk out the front door, you see the graveyard. You walk on the side, you see the graveyard. You walk out the back door, you're standing there looking at tombstones. Y'all telling me the city folk are scared people? I wouldn't be able to sell my house. Huh? I, I wouldn't be able to sell my house. Oh, you wouldn't be able to sell your house. Because this new generation ain't going to do that. <laughs> now, this new generation are buff. They're strong. They're big and bad. But you telling me dead folks scare them? The ghost. So y'all scared of ghosts? Y'all scared of the Holy Ghost? Scared of the Spirit, the Holy Spirit. Some people are scared of the Holy Spirit. I don't want no part of that. Just leave me alone. 
But look at the text. The text declares, verse number four, because he had often been bound with shackles and with chains. And the chains had been pulled apart by him. Mark tells the same story over and over again using the same word between verses one through five. He just keeps telling the same story. He uses different words. He talks about broken. He talks about chains and shackles. These are the same things. He talks about pieces. All these are the same things. So we are observing this. But we have to do our research that we will do in the midst of interpretation. We got to do our research in order to make sure that we have a good understanding of what he's doing, what he's saying, how he's repeating these words, and these words are different words being used, how they do mean the same thing sometimes, and they don't mean the same thing another time. How the same word can mean something different based on the passage. Yes? So, verse number four, because he had been often bound with shackles and chain, the chain had been pulled apart, same thing as broken, by him, and the shackles broken, same thing as pulled apart in pieces, neither could anyone tame him. This man was out of control, and no one could hold him, no one could chain him. As a little boy, we used to sit on first Sunday at the Markham Missionary Baptist Church. And we used to wait on Brother Dave Smith to start shouting. <laughs> Children can be very, very curious and, and very devious when it comes to church worship. We would wait till the singing gets good. We would wait until the preacher gets good. And we would start uh, turning all the way to the side in a 90 degree angle if we have to. Watching Brother Dave Smith over there on the deacon section. <laughs> Brother Dave Smith was a little bit of skinny man. But when Brother Dave Smith started shouting, deacons, preachers could not hold him. Ushers wouldn't even dare try it. Brother Dave Smith would get stiff as a boy. First of all, don't carry folk out there shouting at the New Beginning Church. Pick some of them sleepy jokers over here. Pick them up and take them out. We want people around who are acknowledging God, shouting for the Lord, praising the Lord. Leave them alone. Go over there and wake that joke up that's slobbing all out of his mouth. That's snoring loud enough for the whole congregation to hear. The Bible says that this man had supernatural power he could not be tamed. See, we are trying to tame the wrong people. Shouters and praisers and worshipers, they don't need to be chained. They don't need to be tamed. They don't need to be locked down. They need to be left alone. Maybe, just maybe, someone else in the congregation will get excited. Let them run. Let them run. Lady came to one Sunday that her little boy goes to the sanctified church, as we call it. All churches ought to be sanctified, right? His son, their, her grandson go to the, the Church of God in Christ. So when music start playing, he gets up and start running. Boy, ushers try to zero in him. I said, leave him alone. Let him run. You ought to run with him. We have to make sure we chain the right people, tame the right people, and shackle the right people. Verse 5. And always, night and day, he was in the mountains and in the tombs. Where was he? In the mountains or in the tombs? In the mountains and in the tombs. It get cold out there. In the mountains and in the tombs. In other words, he had no residence as we know it. His residence were in the mountains. His residence were in the tombs. This man needed to be tamed. But no one could tame him. Always, night and day, he was in the mountains and in the tombs, crying out and cutting himself with stone. Let me tell you, the devil will make you hurt yourself. The devil, if your spirit is not tamed, you will hurt yourself. 
Without God, you will hurt yourself. Without a godly mentality, you will damage yourself. I look at young people, they go on good jobs and they brag about the first week they brag about how great their jobs are. And then the second week they tell you, I'm not going to be here for two years. They go on the job letting you know, I'm not going to be here for two years. I'm going to be here long enough to create a resume. I'm going to be, be here long enough. They don't know what the, the plan is for their lives on that job. They have come to the conclusion, this is just what we do. We don't do what you people do. We don't stay on jobs for 30 years. We don't stay in one place for five years. We got to jump around. They go off to college. They enroll in one thing. They take a couple classes. They withdraw from those classes. They enroll in something else. They've been in school five years with no degree. It's because they need to be trained. They need instruction. They, they need direction. They need somebody to say, now, baby, this is how it works. Make sure you get this done. And my, I, I am of the opinion, until a child knows what he or she really wants to do in life, instead of going to a great university, spending all that money, send them to a small a junior college or a community college, let them pay one-fourth the price and get all their basic done. After two years, maybe they know where they are, know what they want to do. And if they're not there after two years, give them another associate degree. We're just throwing money away. We're just throwing time away. And neither of the two you ever get back, Brother Whitlock. And Brother Whitlock, that belongs to God. And we don't want to get rid of God's valuable resources. We have to watch how we... Brother Whitlock was messing with me one, one Sunday during the, the pastor and wife of, um, appreciation. We know that we're going to hear this. We're not doing good things with God's valuable resources. <laughs> What well, folks you can make fun of the pastor. Repeating what he tells us. Yeah, I mean, okay. That's not making fun. That's good stuff, right? Yeah, but you got a goal, you got a purpose, you got to focus. <laughs> so he's night and day in the tombs, in the mountain. He, he's cutting himself. He's crying out aloud. When he was crying out, do you think he was saying, glory, hallelujah to the Lord? You think so? We just talking about occupation. What have you observed in the first five verses that make you think that he wasn't praising God? You don't think people praise God in the tomb? Hmm? He had an spirit. Oh, he had an unclean spirit. Boy, that's that's it there. He had an un, he had an ungodly spirit. Now, if he had have been praising God, it would have been phony. We got some church folk, not at this church, but at church down the street, around the corner, that are praising God in a phony way. Amen. It's all about your motive, right? It's about your motives. Mm -hmm. He's crying out. He's cutting himself. And people, people who think, those of us who think we got good sense, we'll tell you, I ain't going to ever hurt me. I love me too much. How many of y'all say that all the time? Uh, at any time. I'm not going to hurt me. I love me too much. This fella here was out of his mind. He was living in the wrong place. He had the wrong attitude. What I call it was graveyard mentality. And I'm convinced there are some people that are walking among us who have graveyard mentality. They hang out with the dead. I look at some boys sometimes walking across the street. I have to stop and uh, let them cross the street because they're not going to stop for a car. And then they're not going to get in a hurry. And they can't run. So we're like, you know why they can't run? But we're like, tell them why they can't run. Bridges around their knees. And I really, really, really don't want to see your underwear. And I certainly don't want to see your skin. I call it graveyard mentality. Men who could be working, men who could be making a difference, sitting on a tree, sharing lies and swapping about. Graveyard mentality. 
Children that will go to school for a little bit, and once it gets hard, they drop out the graveyard in the town. The state of Mississippi made a bad error a few years ago. I mean, before COVID, they made a bad mistake. They told children, I tell you what, we're going to give you a grant. And if you stay in school for 10 weeks, we're going to give you a grant. $2,000, $2,500, $5,000. If you can just maintain attending school for 10 weeks, we're going to give you some free money. What y'all think happened? Week number 11, where do you think they were? In the line to get that grant. In the line to get that grant so they ain't already spent it before they got it. Mm -hmm. It was only 16 weeks in the semester. <laughs> Why didn't the state of Mississippi think? I tell you what, this is what we'll do. When you get 10 weeks under your belt, we will give you 25% of this grant. See, they needed me on the board. Those children have to work. When I passed off, my children will have to work. Are you with me? You get past 10 weeks, we're going to give you 25%. But when you come to get your 25%, you still have to be enrolled. If you get past 14 weeks, we're going to give you another 25%. And until you, you get through that first semester, we're not going to give you any more than that 50%. So in week 17, you come pick up your other 50%. 10 weeks, they give them $5,000. And guess where they are in week 11? Back at home. And we're not talking, we're not telling them, go ahead and get a degree and we're going to give you money. We're telling them just to stay in school 10 weeks. Bad mistake. Classroom 25 strong. After 10 weeks, classroom five strong. <laughs> Terrible mistake. Maybe that's why our children are so, so ungrateful. This man living in the tomb. Let me tell you, some people cannot see themselves living on a higher plane than they're living. It's graveyard mentality. Some people will, will rather live under the bridge than to live under instruction. Some people would rather live in an apartment than live in a house. Some people would rather live in a shanty that you got to fix every day than have a house that they can live in. It's called graveyard mentality. It's right there in Mark chapter 5. Let's read further. We're just observing some things tonight. Mark chapter 5, verse number 6. Yeah, change happened. It says in verse number six, when he, who is he? Man. The man, what man? Crazy. The man in the tomb, what man in the tomb? The man with the unclean spirit, what man with the unclean spirit? The man that has been shackled, what man that's been shackled? Nobody can tame. The one that no one can tame, what man that nobody can tame? The man that's cutting himself. What man that's cutting himself? Living in the mountains and in the tomb. The man that's living in the mountains and in the tomb. You see how it all fit together when you do observation? So that man that's been cutting himself, that man that's breaking the shackles, the man that nobody can tame, the man that, that's crying out aloud, the man that's going back and forth between the mountains and the tomb, the man that's living and having to dwell in the tomb, that man, when he saw Jesus... From a fall. Verse number six. When he saw Jesus from a fall, he did what? He saw. And, and when he saw, who did he see? Jesus. And how close did he get to Jesus when he saw him? A long way off. Far off, right? When he saw Jesus afar off, from afar, he saw Jesus. What did he do? He ran and worshipped who? Look at this thing. This same man that y'all just told me that was shackled. The same man that you told me that had graveyard mentality. The same man you said was cutting himself with stone. The same man you said that broke the chain. 
The same man that you said was not able to be tamed. The same man sees Jesus. He does what? He runs to Jesus. And what did he do when he ran to him? He ran and he worshiped Jesus. Let me just tell you. Jesus can change your situation. Good God Almighty. And we just talk about observation. We just talk about observation. Just observation. Observation is the foundation of hermeneutics in the hermeneutical process. Biblical hermeneutics is compared to a sea of gold. You got a whole sea out there. Water is covering it, but it's gold down deep under the water. And when you go out there and you mine for gold, and whatever you comes up in a sift, what's called a sifter? Sifter? Whatever you come up with, that's the real gold. What we're doing, we are mining for gold. We're looking for the nuggets in God's word. We're just looking to see what God has written. We're just looking to see what God is presenting to us. So the first step of observation is to read the passage in its surrounding passage. Read the passage. The first step to observation is to read the passage. To do what? We're not reading for understanding. We're just reading. Dr. Richard Jewell Rose in, 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 in the Academy would tell us back in the 90s, you don't understand the passage until you read it 50 times. He didn't say listen to it 50 times. He said read it 50 times. You about to get it in your mind if you read it 50 times. Now after you read it 50 times, you can listen to it 50 times. So the first step in observation is to read the passage in the surrounding passages. Because the passage that we have focused on is called a pericope. What is a pericope? One complete thought, right? Is what we after, it's one complete thought. If you read verses one through 20, and we're not gonna get any further than seven tonight. If you read verses one through 20 in Mark chapter five, you will find out this is the first pericope. And when you read this first pericope, you will find out that everything is contained in that one thought. Look at verse number six. Number six gives us a turning point. You hear me? Verses one through five, this dude was a bad actor. Let me tell you, he was a bad actor. In, in engineering, in, in the industry, if you have a pump or a seal, and that seal keep failing in that pump, or that pump keep failing, that pump is labeled a bad actor. That seal is called a bad actor. So when we want to get things right in the plant, we focus on the bad actors, and then the, we can decrease the failures. The same way it is with um, sickle cell. If you can get rid of some of the sickle celled uh, blood, flow, you can get rid of some of the sickle cell, then your sickle cell anemia will go down. We need the right blood flow, right? Because with sickle cell, it cuts you and makes it feel like glass is running through your pain. So in order to decrease the pain, you need to decrease the sickle cell. So when you do that, when you look at this man that's running and crying in the tomb, you gotta, you gotta deal with that. Somebody gotta deal with it. Somebody has to deal with it. Somebody has to deal with it. Dude told me another day, he said, well, it, it ain't costing us anything. It is costing us something. If you got a man sitting outside the gate and can't get in, it's costing somebody. Mm. Somebody's paying for it. Are you with me? So when you look at this man, somebody has to deal with it. This guy is terrorizing the whole community. Mm. WWE fighters get back. Mike Tyson is not a match. Floyd Mayweather, world champion for 50 fights that he's never lost one. Floyd Mayweather does not compare to this guy. 
this guy is a bad actor. But look what happens when he sees Jesus. The Bible says when he sees Jesus, when he saw Jesus, and he saw him from a far distance, he saw him from far away, he saw him from far off far. He ran and worshiped Jesus. Woo, good God Almighty. Now that'll preach on Wednesday night. Verse number seven. And he cried out with a loud voice and said, Who did? Who cried out with a loud voice? Jesus? It's a capital H. <laughs> you just told me with Jesus because it's chapter 8. So with a lot of shaking here. Talk to him. I don't have a you don't have a chapter 8? No, I don't either. Oh, it's not. <laughs> I was about to say that it started the sentence right. That's why it's chapter 8. Okay. <laughs> and when he saw Jesus. Okay, let's say it got a chapter 8. Mm -hmm. why would, how would we know? We're just doing an observation. How would we know that even though it's a capital H, how will we know it's not Jesus? Number one, it's only a, it would be a calculation that begins the sentence, right? Number two, when we tie the verses together, remember, observation, you're reading the, the passage in the surrounding passages. Okay, so observation. Because some Bibles consider verses one through five the pericope. Because it changes to something else. It focuses us on something else. I've chosen to go one through seven. Look at it where it says, verse number seven. And he cried out with a loud voice and said, What's the other clue that it's not Jesus? Jesus has no need to cry out with a loud voice. What else do we know? He's talking to Jesus. Jesus is the second person. How we know Jesus said the He says, He said, What have I? And then King James says, What have we to do with you, Jesus? Son of the Most High God. I need to make a point right here. When Jesus shows up, even the demons recognize Jesus. Isn't that something? When Jesus shows up on the scene, even Jesus. Jesus is even recognized by the demons. And we got church folk don't recognize Jesus. We got Christians that don't recognize Jesus. But look at the text. Verse number seven says, and he cried out with a loud voice and said, what have we to do with you, Jesus? And then he classifies or he identifies Jesus by saying, saying, Son of the Most High God. What have we to do to you, Jesus? You are the Son of the Most High God. The other thing is, not only do they recognize him, they respect him. How do I know he respect him? Because he stopped tearing the man up. Now, is this the man talking? Is this the man talking? Is this the man talking? The demons within the man. Is it the man talking? So you know the story, right? So let's just assume it's the man talking. It's really the demons talking, right? So he says, he says, well, what we have to do with you, Jesus, son of the most high God, I implore you by God that you do not torment me. So he respects Jesus. There are people who Jesus has blessed all their lives in several ways and they don't respect Jesus. This man, and we're just doing observation, this man respects Jesus. How do you know when a person respects Jesus? They won't do anything, won't say anything, because they know Jesus is still watching, even though we don't see him in the flesh. Are you with me? Who's watching? Jesus. God. The Holy Spirit. Watching. So the first step to observation is to read the passage and the surrounding passages. The second step to observation is to repeat the first step and read it as many times as you need to. 
I suggest 50 times, because that's what I was told, 50 times, or until you know the story well. Why is it every Sunday that I don't have to go and read about how they led Jesus up the hill called Golgotha? Why well, don't I have to turn my Bible and say, oh, they hung him and they dropped him? Why do I have to open my Bible and say uh, the saints begin to rise up in Jerusalem from the dead when Jesus died on okay? Why do I have to open my Bible and say I have to know the story. And you have to know the story well. You have to get, this is the third thing for observation, you have to get a sense of unity of the passage. That's why you read before and after. Sometimes you have to read even the chapters before and after. Some have suggested that you read the first chapter, the first three chapters, then read, the, read up to this chapter. So you need to get an understanding of the unity of the whole book or the whole chapter. And you want to look at these things. You want to look at structure. Look at theme. Look at progress. Look at interaction. You want to look at structure. Themes, progress, and interactions. The third step to observation are to ask some questions. And you're going to get this right away. The third step to observation is to ask some questions. And these are the questions. Who, what, when, where, why and how, the six of them. Who, what, when, where, why, and how. Again, there are some questions you need to ask. Who, what, when, where, why, and how. So the homework assignment is to use verses one through seven, Mark chapter five, reading verses 1 through 7 and out from these questions, who, what, when, where, why, and how, identify the people and identify the things going on. Who's in the text? What's in the text? When is in the text? Where is in the text? And why is it in the text? And how is it in the text? Will y'all do that for me? Will y'all do that for you? Do that for me. So we're just talking about observation. We'll, we'll talk more about Mark chapter 5 next week and we'll observe some more things. These are five, the first six verses, first seven verses. So your homework assignment is to deal with the first seven verses. Come back and tell us who, what, when, where, how, why, and did I miss one? And where. Okay? There may be somebody listening that don't know Jesus. Jesus is the one that died for your sins and rose from the dead. The same Jesus that we address here in Mark chapter 5. He went on to die on a skull hill called Calvary. He died, he was laid in a borrowed tomb, and he rose from the dead. He can come into your life today. Would you just bow your head with me and invite Jesus Christ into your life? Believing that he's the son of God. And of obedience unto God, he gave his life as a ransom for you and me. To say these words in prayer, Lord Jesus, I believe that you are the Son of God. I believe that you died for my sins. I believe that you rose from the dead. Now come into my life and make me a new person. Thank you for saving my soul in Jesus' name. Amen and thank God. We believe that you're now saved, you're born again, and you're going to heaven when you leave here. Whatever you do, stay with Jesus. Trust Jesus, respect Jesus, and Jesus will change your life as he has changed this man's life. Stay with Jesus. When we thank God for who he is and what he's already done. We thank God for just being God and doing what he does. Amen and thank God. Let me spend this time to say to you, thank you for your prayers. For everybody that's listed on our prayer list, thank you.
for praying for them. And I also want to say a personal thanks to you for praying for my daughter. She is now home. She is no longer on the ventilator. Uh, she is no longer struggling. And she will be reporting to work at roll call in the morning. Amen. Amen. So thank God for, for God's strength and God's power. Thank you for, for joining me in prayer and in this very, very touching those situation. Amen. I told her you need to be praising him and you need to tell your story of how God has blessed you and given you another chance to do what he's called you to do. Amen. It is often time, it's time to give to God through tithes, often and sacrificial gifts. If you want to give by way of, of zeal, you can do so by sending your gifts to Listing.jesus at yahoo.com. Listing.jesus at yahoo.com. If you want to mail your gift, you can do so by mailing it to P.O. Box 503, Missouri City, Texas, 77459. That is P.O. Box 503, Missouri City, Texas, 77459. Thank you so much for giving. Thank you so much for entrusting what God has blessed you and your resources to our care that God will continue to bless you. Father God, we thank you for these gifts. We ask you to bless every giver and bless every gift. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank God. Please continue to join us for Bible study on Wednesday night at 715. Join us, please, for Bible study at 7. Uh, 15 every Wednesday night. Join us on Sunday morning for our much powerful Sunday school classes that are being taught at 9 a.m. Please join us at 9 a.m. on Sunday mornings. Please join us at 9 a.m. every Sunday morning for Sunday school. And then come and join us at 10.30 a.m. for our worship service, our morning worship service. Thank you so much for being a part of our service. Thank you for joining us and thank you for continuing to give to our ministry. Thank you. God bless you and God keep you is our prayer. Now to him who is able to keep us from falling. Unto him the only wise and only true God. Unto him be power, glory and dominion. Until we meet again let us join by saying Amen and Amen. We want to say a big happy birthday to one of our senior members, one of our senior members, Miss Dorita, Miss Dorita Harris. Thank you so much for just keeping us with you and being on the land of the living. Thank God for you, and we say happy birthday to you. God bless you. God keep you. It's our prayer.